In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, thank you, Father. It's nice to uh, be with you tonight, and uh, for all of you who have uh, joined, uh, it's my uh, distinct uh, pleasure to, to be with you uh, from St. Tegon's Monastery. It's uh, America's oldest Orthodox monastery, founded in 1905 by St. Tegon of Moscow. Uh, we have five canonized saints who lived, walked, taught, and were here at the monastery, uh, and many unknown saints like uh, the late, uh, pro probably Metropolitan Leonti of Blessed Repose and Father Vasily, one of the monks for 50 years here. Um, and uh, so we have a daily cycle of services. Liturgy has been offered here at the monastery for over 120 years, 115 years, something like that. Uh, every day the liturgy is served and uh, during Lenten periods, we serve the full cycle of services and throughout the year, those full cycle of services are ongoing. So just know that, uh, you know, we are always praying for you, for the church. And if you have any special requests, you can always send them to uh, the website or to me personally. Uh, we'll be glad to, to help because really the miracle of prayer is something which is uh, a bit undervalued, uh, underrated and undervalued. A lot of times we're very busy in our modern world, even with COVID and so forth. And so the question for all of us is to constantly reevaluate what we think prayer is why we think it's important and how to do it. What, what are the mechanics of it? And this is not uh, an easy question, uh, but the reality is, is that uh, from a monastic standpoint, the main work of the monastery is, here is prayer. We do a lot of other things, but the first thing that we always try to do is prayer. And when we put prayer first, we really put God first because as St. Silouan tells us, if we say, I love God, that means I pray. And that life of prayer is something that we have to cultivate. As uh, St. Theophon, the recluse, there's a book that's uh, one of the volumes of the Philokalia. It's kind of a subset of the Philokalia on prayer, different prayers uh, of the heart, as it were. I think it was, uh, I can't remember exactly what the original Russian was, but in the English, it's been translated as the title is The Art of Prayer. And it's important to look at prayer as another one of the uh, art forms of the church, just like there's iconography. Um, there's beautiful uh, architecture, there's beautiful um, vestments, there's also a, a beauty to prayer, and there is, there is a real art to it that we, uh, as Orthodox Christians, should try to cultivate and, and try to use in our own lives so that our lives become beautiful through that, that beauty of prayer. Really, the, the thing that imparts to us the life of God the most is this openness and receptivity to uh, God through prayer, and as the psalmist reminds us, uh, the, the main mechanic of, of knowing God and of coming to the knowledge of God to, to this art of prayer is, is encapsulated in the psalmist's words, be still and know that I'm God. When we're still, it's when God can speak to the heart and the deep heart, not just uh, like um, maybe uh, do this or do that, but rather a, an impartation of his own life, which informs the heart and gives us a spiritual sensation that we wouldn't have any other way. Really, it's God speaking to us, but on a much deeper level, an information or a formation of the heart that imparts grace to us and, and helps us to understand our lives and the life of the church. So this essence of, of be still and know, um, it's kind of the foundation of the deeper life of prayer in the church. And of course, we experience the liturgical life of prayer in the church often with, of course, the beautiful liturgy and the beautiful vespers. Uh, sometimes you might see matins or maybe great compliment at the nativity of Christ. Um, all of these services kind of confirm that we have a, a life of prayer in the church, which is an art form. Uh, the liturgical life is, it's very artfully done uh, in the sense of it can be almost like a symphony or a dance whereby we experience uh, the, this culture of the church, which is given to us at each liturgy, especially the more um, adept that those who are singing and serving are, uh, the more that this uh, transference of, of life is given to us. And it's really through that knowledge of God that we uh, gain our union with God. You know, St. Uh, John Climacus tells us in uh, one of the treatises, you know, he has that book of the ladder. A lot of people read the ladder every Lent. Some people read um, summations of it. I know there's a nice summary of the ladder that's out. I can't remember who the author is, but it's called the uh, steps to heaven or something like this. And it's basically a summary of St. John Climacus's famous seventh century text on the ladder of divine ascent. And the ladder of divine ascent is in, in 
it's a kind of a, a, a step by step how to uh, of perfection. And so really, it's kind of a, a very weighty book, a, a difficult book to 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 go through and to receive. But most importantly, the, the thing that he talks about is he puts prayer as like some of the last steps of uh, at the latter, I think it's step 28 that he talks about prayer. And it's not that it's not the, the first thing that we do. It's more that in that movement towards perfection, prayer is something that is cultivated and eventually comes about uh, to be mm, that art form or that uh, per, kind of nearing to perfection relatively late in our life in the church. And so in that summation on step 28 of, about prayer, he says that prayer is the converse and union with God. Basically, it's our conversation that we have with God that affects our union with God. And this union with God is our salvation. So if we were to talk about, you know, the question, how are you saved or how are you saved? The reality is, is that we're saved in our union with Christ. It's, it's that deep and abiding union that St. Gregory Palamas talks about. Um, we just commemorated him last Sunday, and he really was the great expositor about salvation, about how how we're saved. And really, he spoke about this deep and abiding union that we have with God that's like unto a marriage, but even deeper, he says, where the saints so uh, interpenetrate God and God so interpenetrates the saints, and that this union is something which is um, a union without confusion forever. And this is what he calls salvation. St. Peter also talks about this in his uh, epistle. I think it's the second epistle, the first chapter, the fourth verse. He says, and to you are given exceedingly great and precious promises that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now, this partaking or this union that kind of divinizes us or gives us God's life is something that's God's gift to us. We were created for union, if we could say anything for, for, for certain. And this union is most affected through our life of prayer. Um, now, of course, you know, communion is an obvious point, but we really do have to prepare for communion. The more they, the fathers say, the more that we prepare for communion, the more we'll receive it. We have to be open and, and ready and available to it. It's not just enough to just go up and receive, but really we have to be at peace with all. We have to make that good confession if there's something that we um, need to, to feel that we need to get off our chest, that we need to be receiving forgiveness for God or reconciled with others. We need to make all those things right. And then that, that preparation of communion, pre preparation for communion, to the extent that we prepare is to the extent that we'll receive. So as we think of prayer, we really need to think first and foremost of prayer as a conversation that we have with God that brings about our union with God, which is our salvation. And it's a similar thing when it says, it says in the Old Testament that Moses spoke to God as one who would, would speak with his friend. And when he spoke with God as his friend, he came down from the mountain so radiant with light that they could barely look at him. Many saints also, too, uh, experienced this light. And in fact, Christ himself, our Lord and our God, on the account of the in the transfiguration in Luke's gospel and uh, Matthew's gospel, they have uh, varying details that are all quite uh, exceptional. Um, but I think it's in Luke's gospel where it says, and as he prayed, his face was changed and he became white and light. And so it's the same thing for us. As we pray, we have that opportunity to, be, to become enlightened or full of light, that light that comes from God, just like Moses, just like the, the, the prophets, and just like Christ himself. Um, interestingly, just as a side note, in Luke's gospel, it also says that when the disciples were fully awake, they saw the glory of God. There was a, you know, that note that said that they were kind of sleepy, heavy with sleep. But then it says when they were fully awake, they saw the glory of God. And it's the same thing for us. Prayer is a movement towards a greater sense of watchfulness and of uh, an enlarging of our sense of consciousness, our sense of present, of being present in the moment, present to God, present to ourselves. This movement of watchfulness or this neptic tradition of the church really is the great treasury that the church offers to all of us. The neptic or the watchful tradition uh, has its basis uh, in the Lord's own words. He says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. This watchfulness is uh, not only outward, but more quintessentially inward. And this watchfulness actually is given to us in part when we say the Jesus prayer. Father Zacharias says that uh, Father Zacharias is one of the uh, modern teachers on prayer and on spiritual life. He's associated with our monastery here at St. Tegon of Zidans. He's the, the disciple of St. Sophroni, who is the disciple of St. Silouan. 
um, all of whom have seen the uncreated light uh, to some degree and have spoke about it in their texts. Again, only a few in a generation experience that light, but really the, the fathers tell us that only a few in, the gen in, a, in every generation need to see that light because most of us couldn't bear it, number one. And the other aspect is, is that light conveys to them something in the same way that it conveyed to St. Paul when he saw that light and he was knocked from his horse and he became the great apostle Paul through that encounter. Uh, similarly, the prophet Isaiah saw that light and Moses saw that light and our modern saints, they still continue to see that light and that light is given to us through them. And so as we encounter uh, Father Zacharias, he has this, he, ha he said uh, specifically, he said that using the Jesus prayer imparts to us the grace of watchfulness. It actually increases our ability to be watchful over our own thoughts, over our own feelings, over our own heart. And this is the place where we're going to find God because the kingdom of heaven is not over there. It's not over here, but it's rather within the Lord tells us the kingdom of heaven is within. So I uh, asked me to speak uh, about prayer tonight. And really, I would say that the most important uh, context is this um, understanding of uh, the neptic tradition or the watchful sober sobriety uh, tradition in our church that's not just sobriety from uh, the drunkenness from wine, but also sobriety from the drunkenness of the passions, uh, which tend to inebriate us as we move towards them and blind us. Uh, I had one friend who tells me, he says, don't be, don't be mesmerized by the mirage of the passions. The passions are things like lust, envy, greed, pride, etc. So th the first movement of prayer really is, is given to us in the, the, the account of the prodigal son. Uh, the prodigal son, you know, he's he's an image of um, for us of of going away from God. You know, the prodigal son leaves the the father's house, which is really, um, you know, the presence of God. He leaves the father's house and he goes into a wild, far off country, which is you know basically the an image of the passions and and of of sin. And in order for him to go back to the father's house, we actually hear uh, the account. It says. Before he goes back to the father's house, there's a very important uh, phrase that's given. It says he, he came to himself. He came to himself and he said, oh, my father has uh, servants that are eating better than I am and, and are doing better than I am. He says, I will return. I will arise and go to my father's house. This movement of coming to ourselves really is the first movement of prayer. Uh, it's very easy for us to start talking to God. And that's a very um, important part of the whole equation. But really... The first step is to come back to our own heart, back to our own uh, sense of ourself and of our own center, which is in our heart, and from there to speak to God. So we can't just start praying. You know, it'd be easy to say, well, just pray. Well, that's a nice thought, and it's, it's also true. We can do that, but if we're going to be more technical about it and, and, and discover that art of prayer, really the first movement is to come to ourselves. And that's really to come back to my own heart and then from that place to speak to God. Somebody's, uh, everybody's okay. All right. Uh, so this is the first movement, this movement back to our own heart. And then from that heart, because a lot of times, you know, uh, St. Gregory Palamas talks extensively about this, how the epitome of this, of the fall is a movement away from ourselves, out towards the creation away from ourselves and ultimately away from God. And so the, the first movement back in the process of salvation and, and of deeper spiritual life is a movement back to my own heart. And then from there, I speak to God. Uh, Father Zacharias talks about this, how uh, the easiest way that we can um, understand this is when we're in pain. Let's say we're going through a difficult trial or temptation, something has happened in our life. And we really, uh, from that place of pain, uh, God kind of brings us to ourselves. He kind of shakes us to the core sometimes. And then from that place, a lot of times we cry out to God. And we all know what that's like. We all know where that place of pain is from when we cry out to God and we're in desperate need. And that's kind of a, a little bit of a, of, of a model that we can use for our own life of prayer, because we may not be in dire pain, but it shows us exactly where to speak to God from. This little bit of pain that we have when we speak to God from that place, it gives us a, a point of reference about where we should typically speak to God from, which is that deeper place of our own heart, inside our heart. 
So understanding that prayer is a conversation that we have with God that brings about our union with God and that the Jesus prayer is used as a, as a tool, not as an, an end, in of, end in and of itself, but rather as a, as a tool by which we cultivate that our, the place of our own heart and speak to God because it's the simplest prayer and it's called a monologistic prayer, which means the prayer of one word or prayer of one thought. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. It's a confession of the divinity of Christ, which we can't do without the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's using the name of God, which enables us to, you know, call upon the right person. You know, the, the fathers say um, it's a great gift for us to know the name of God. And all of us have had an experience at one point in our life or another when we knew that Jesus Christ was the Lord and that somehow there was a revelation when we either came back to the church or when we became more committed uh, to the life of the church. There's always a point in our life at some point where we know who Jesus really is. And we get an understanding of what that name is. And to call on that name says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, it says that in the New Testament. Well, it's not just about doing it one time, but really it's about coming, coming to a deeper knowledge of that name of just who that is. A lot of times we say the Jesus prayer and I myself, I think, gosh, I'm entering more deeply into knowing who this really is, this person of the Lord who is God himself, God incarnate in this world, who lives, who lived in this world and now is enthroned in the right hand of the Father on high. So using the Jesus prayer is kind of like a channel or a tool that helps us to, to, to touch something which is um, in uh, almost, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, unreachable or untouchable. It's almost like calling out the name of a friend, you know. Uh, we reach the person through their name. And in a similar way, Christ who fills all things is reached through his name. So the Jesus prayer gives us an opportunity. It's not a talisman. It's not, it's not a... Um, and in and of itself, it's a beginning, and it's a way that we can carry on a conversation with God that is unto salvation, that quest for mercy. You know, it's the, the Lord himself says, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Now, he says at the Last Supper, he says, ask and you will receive in my name. And so we ask in his name, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. And this mercy is God's life. It's his grace. It's his energy. It's his love. It's everything that we need. God's mercy to us, you know, everything that happens to us in our life that's good is by God's mercy. So all we're doing is asking for more of those good things. So the Jesus prayer is, is that beginning point that we can use without fear, because really there's no, no uh, probability for us in, in being, uh, you know, completely deluded. You know, a lot of times God will find ways of humbling us and instructing us. And prayer will teach us how to pray. Uh, St. John Climacus tells us, he says, that God grants prayer to him who prays. This gift of prayer that's given to us through prayer is something that we need to seek. And if we actively seek it, we'll find it. Uh, in the New Testament, it says, knock and it will be open. Seek and you'll find. Uh, this uh, word that's used in the Greek in the New Testament is actually keep knocking, keep seeking, uh, keep searching, uh, and the door will be open. It's a constant um, activity as far as the Greek New Testament is concerned. So we have to keep knocking in prayer. We have to keep seeking in prayer. And it's through this activity that we find God's mercy, which is very real and tangible once we get into a more um, dedicated life of prayer. Um, I wrote a book um, called Acquiring the Mind of Christ that deals specifically with this uh, understanding of the church's prayer and about how to do a, um, a prayer rule that's consistent but small. So I'll offer it to you that same prayer rule because I speak at parishes a lot <clears throat> and a lot of times people who just tell me, they say, you know, just tell us what to do. Um, I don't know exactly what to do. Just tell me what, how to do this. Just, you know, give me a very short <laughs> rule that I can use to, to kind of touch some of these things that you're talking about. So <clears throat> I call this rule the five and five rule. Um, the five and five rule is, is, is pretty simple. I kind of broke it down into like the most, uh, you know, necessary parts. And using the church's tradition, we know that uh, all prayers in the church, they always start with the Trisagion, O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, O Most Holy Trinity, etc., all the way through our Father. That's just the normal way that we, we start praying in the church. No service uh, really begins without that. So um, we start with the Trisagion, 
And I, I would say, you know, there's there's three basic rules that, that I always start with when we're talking about prayer. The first one is be consistent. If you're going to, to have a life of prayer, um, it doesn't have to be a long rule. It doesn't have to be a, a, a rule that's really complicated. The reality is, is it just has to be a consistent rule. The more consistent we are, the more the fruits of prayer that we'll receive. And, you know, time and time again, I, I, I um, come back to the fact that I believe deeply in my heart that there is no greater miracle in this world than the miracle of prayer. Prayer can do anything. Prayer can move mountains. Prayer can, can uh, give light where there's darkness. Prayer can give health where there's disease. Prayers, prayers can raise the dead. Prayer, I, at the monastery, people oftentimes ask for prayers. And um, the, my prayers are not that strong as it were, but the corporate prayer of the church is very strong. And especially the altar at St. Ticon's, you know, when you serve liturgy somewhere for 115 or 20 years or whatever it is, um, those prayers uh, that are offered at the altar, you know, especially from a new priest, when I, whenever I know somebody's really in trouble, I'm always excited to know that there's a new priest that maybe is ordained and that's serving liturgy at the altar because their prayers are very powerful. They say for the first seven days, a new priest, they have just extremely uh, great grace and boldness before God. Uh, they lose it eventually because they're only human, but that initial grace that's given to the priest, I always go up and I give them a name or two or somebody who's very sick or suffering and always 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 so many miracles so many people that are not well become well people that are, have difficulties find uh, relief people that are in need find what they they need um just over and over again i see that that reality of prayer working it does work it's it's miraculous you know and i come back to it again in my own life it's like there's nothing greater for me than to be able to be consistent in my prayer rule because it, it gives me life. It gives me hope. It gives me strength. It gives light when I have darkness. It gives me health when I have sickness. Uh, it gives me spiritual wellness when I know that I'm a sinner and, and in desperate need of God's mercy. It gives me everything from God. And it's not some, uh, it's not really my own effort per se. It's just that consistency. That's like that faithful, like the widow who just keeps asking the unjust judge in Luke's gospel, the 18th chapter, get vengeance on my enemies, get vengeance on my enemies. It's like, it says in the gospel, it says, uh, the just judge says about the woman, it says, I'm going to go ahead and give her what she wants because of her tenacity and because she keeps asking me. It says, how much more will God give good things to those who ask? And so this consistency in prayer gains God's mercy. Um, so the first rule is to be consistent. Second rule is to, um, let's see here, I've, it's been a while since I've taught about this, you know, I'm not teaching this semester, I teach in the fall. So I have to think about it for a second. The second rule is to, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of late for me. I'm not, I'm not used to being up, uh, you know, past eight o'clock or nine o'clock. It's almost my bedtime, so I apologize. I might also start telling jokes too, but uh, I'll sign off before we get too, too many of those out. Um, the second rule is to start again. I think that's actually the third one, but I remember what the the the, the second that the third one is. So we'll use that as the second one. Always with prayer, you know, there's just a a, a sense in 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 prayer where I need to um, forget what I've done yesterday, how good it was, how bad it was. It doesn't matter how much I've prayed or not prayed, or I haven't prayed in years, or whatever it is that we can use. All that stuff becomes kind of a psychological barrier to prayer. So I, I using the words of Saint Paul, it says forgetting what's behind and straining towards what's ahead, I press onward to the high calling uh, that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And it's the same thing for us in prayer. We have to just start again. You can't ever say, oh, I've arrived or I've, I've accomplished something or, you know, okay, I've seen a miracle. That's enough. It's this constant sense of return. Really the essence of, of prayer, especially when we're thinking about it as prayer of the heart, which is where we really need to pray to God from, there's no time at which I can say to myself, oh, I'm praying. You know, if I, if I think that, then I'm, I'm not really praying. There's just a constant return back to my own heart, back to God, back to the remembrance of God. And really, as St. Basil says, the remembrance of God is the presence of God. And this foundation of, of prayer starts with the remembrance of God. The remembrance of God is, is, is uh, heralded by many of the fathers as um, one of the great uh, medicines uh, that heals us of the passions. Uh, St. Mark the Ascetic says that there's three great passions that undergird all the other passions, three great giants, he says, and one of them is the forgetfulness of God. So 
the more we remember God, the more we have an opportunity to move towards virtue and towards health of soul. Um, but it's, a, it's something that I continually just start to do again. And really, as I'm going throughout my day, I just try to remember the Lord and ask for his blessing, his help in whatever I'm doing. A lot of times, um, this is a very simple way for us to kind of keep an ongoing prayer rule throughout the day is just to constantly ask God to bless what we're doing, to bless our family as we're cooking dinner, to bless our family as we're eating, uh, to bless our, our work as we're working at work, to bless the people around us. Um, this constant invocation of God's blessing really brings God's blessing. Isn't that amazing? I mean, can, can you imagine it? But we have not because we ask not. And so this this understanding that this constant invocation of God's blessing upon what we're doing and, and where we're at and who we're with really brings about a change in our life, especially for the people that we don't like, especially for the people that are troubling us, especially for the people that um, are not um, not doing the right thing and being doing what they should be doing. Um, our asking God to bless those people who are our enemies brings about a change in the whole tenor of our situations. Oftentimes, it can only be called miraculous. So this constant starting again and this constant return to the Lord is something that we never stop doing. Um, really, prayer is defined by St. Theophon as an inner turning of the heart to the Lord, an inner turning of the heart to the Lord. This inner turning, which is so slight, but very perceptible as we study the art of prayer, um, is something that's uh, really the essence of prayer. You know, he says it's, it doesn't matter necessarily the words. He says it's the inner turning of the heart to the Lord, which brings about uh, the work of prayer. And so whatever we're doing uh, when, when we're praying, it should be this constant return or this constant effort to re to return to the Lord and to be present to God, because the reality is, is that God is always here, but I am not. I'm not present to that. I'm doing other things. I'm busy. I'm distracted, whatever. Uh, but this inner turning of the heart to the Lord is what is kind of the medicine um, that really gives a, a little bit of spark to the heart and enables us to find the fire of God in our own heart. So before I give you the third rule, which I forgot, but it'll come to me because I, if I, as I keep talking, it'll you know, pop up in my memory bank, God willing. But that return back to the five and five rule. Um, we're talking about uh, beginning that our prayer rule uh, with the Tersagian. Now it's important that you don't, that you don't, that you don't do, you don't do your prayer. It's dangerous while driving. But you need to have a consistent time where you always say that I'm going to pray. So whether you're a morning person or an evening person, that's when you do it. If you're awake in the morning, then that's when you do your prayers. If you're awake in the evening, that's when you do your prayers. You could do it in the evening and morning, but at least you have one solid time where you're saying, I'm going to try to pray and make a conscious effort to connect with the creator of all. So that consistency in prayer is, is, is the starting point. The Trisagion is how we begin it. And then uh, we can say Psalm 50 if we like or not. You know, I mean, you could just start right in. It's just, this is all very, oh, I remember. Now I know what the second rule is or the third one in this case, you know, be flexible and do what works. Prayer is not something that is like a, a rigid um, system, you know, that we systematize and then we check the box and say, oh, I, I, I did prayer. I did my prayers today. So now I'm good. It's not like that. It's, it's not a rule. It's a relationship. It's something that we do where we're talking to another person. You know, we are persons and we are made in God's image and God is person. If I am person and I'm made in God's image, how much more is God like supreme person or like person plus? Um, we know that the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three divine persons who are uh, it, they co-inhere in one each other, in one another. They are three persons, but one in essence, or one as one uh, person interpreted, one being. Three persons, but one being. There's only one being in God. That's the unity of the Godhead. But there's three persons there. It's a mystery, and in this mystery, we we know that this safeguards the mystery of the Godhead because you say, "Well, I can't understand three persons in one being." I said, "Well, that's good because nobody can understand God." If you could understand God, it wouldn't be God because God is uncreated and it's beyond everything. It's even beyond being. 
God is beyond, beyond, beyond everything. Everything we can think of, it's not that. So, but person is this mystery in which we encounter our, not only that mystery of our own personhood, um, and really our life is a gift, you know, the life, the life that we've been given, it's a sacred gift. Life is sacred and it's a gift that's given to us. And the mystery of our own personhood will be something that we explore in prayer because the deeper we uh, go and understanding ourselves, we'll also concurrently understand God. And the more we understand about God is also uh, in, a, in, a, in a similar movement, more we'll understand about ourselves. It's a concurrent movement. As I move towards God, I'll know more about myself. I'll see myself more clearly. And in knowing myself more clearly, I'll understand more clearly who God is and what he wants from me and what I need to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this flexibility that we need in prayer is imperative because we can't be too rigid. You know, I would say that the, the most important thing that you can do is spend a certain amount of time in prayer every day. You know, so it's like if a good place to start if you say well i've never really prayed before and i don't really know how to pray and i've maybe done some of the prayers from the prayer book but i haven't been consistent i would say well just start with this five and five rule and try for 10 minutes a day just being consistent and if you know you can do that then i'd say 20 minutes a day but i would probably put a cap at that for quite a while until you get used to it it's kind of like getting used to hot water you can't get used to it very quickly and you need to kind of warm up to it and kind of get, and then you can kind of do a little bit more. You can turn up the temperature a little bit more because prayer is a, is a bit of a fire, you know. We can't stomach too much of it at, at, uh, at the beginning. So 10 minutes is a good benchmark just to start for. And after you say that you're sagging prayer, you can say Psalm 50 if you like, which is a great kind of quintessential psalm that encompasses repentance and, um, you know, asking for God's mercy, creating me a clean heart of oh God, renew a right spirit within me that uh, prayer of the prophet David, it's a, it's a great psalm, and you can say it often, you know. Then if you like, you could say the creed or not. I know this is kind of nebulous and, and a little bit uh, maybe too flexible for some people, but you have to do what works. And so, again, Trisagian, Psalm 50, the creed, and then, again, creed and Psalm 50 are optional. Then I would say involving the body is a very important part in the work of prayer. And as one person said, our, our journey of prayer is a journey not away from the body, but deeper into the body, because the kingdom of heaven really is within. It's not, it's not a metaphor. It really is in the body. The body is part of salvation. So involving the body in prayer, the easiest way to do that is to do prostrations. So I would say do five prostrations using the Jesus prayer. Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, and then go all the way down to the floor and touch your head to the floor. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. Involving the body, going all the way down to the floor, touching your head to the floor, and then maybe um, you're already distracted, so you say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon my children. All the way down to the floor. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon my spouse. All the way down to the floor. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon thy world. All the way down to the floor. After those five prostrations, try saying the Jesus prayer for just five minutes. So that's why I call it the five and five rule, because basically it's a Trisagion with five prostrations and then five minutes saying the Jesus prayer. And this rule can evolve into something higher. So you could do 10 prostrations and 10 minutes saying the Jesus prayer, 20 prostrations and 20 minutes saying the Jesus prayer. But this is just a small beginning to kind of get your toe in the door. Five minutes saying the Jesus prayer. So you can hear it, but that nobody else can hear it. You move your mouth, you use your body and you say the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy upon me. Drop the sinner because it's too many words. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. It's a complete form of the Jesus prayer that's not too long and not too short. You say it uh, quickly, more quickly if you're distracted. You say it more slowly if you're less distracted. But the main thing is that you're using your mouth and you have a prayer rule, or excuse me, a prayer rope uh, that again involves the body. So you're using your prayer rope. And again, you're doing this for time. You're not doing this to just get it done like Jesus prayer, Jesus prayer, Jesus prayer, Jesus prayer. You're doing it so that you can actually start to look inside because this is the great tool of the Jesus prayer. It helps us to look inside. And then when we look deep enough in, we see God. We see God inside because you're not going to find him outside. He's going to, where's he going to be? He's, he wants to be in the heart. He wants to be enthroned in the heart. He wants to be uh, found in the heart because, you know, even in the, in the Proverbs, I think it was in the Old Testament, it says, son, give me thine heart. Give me your heart. 
This is what God wants because this is the place that God wishes to be enthroned. This is the only throne for God that we have. The church is just uh, the altar in the church is, is a, a physical place, but really the spiritual place is in the heart. So the place that Christ is enthroned in is in the heart and he can actually mm, abide there in a way that's, that's uh, palpable. And in fact, the saints, you know, they experience God to such a degree there that uh, it's uh, uh, not only um, something they're sensible of, but it actually starts to affect their bodies as well. Uh, eventually when the bodies uh, pass away from this life, they uh, are either incorrupt or their bones pour out myrrh or, you know, any number of strange things that show that the body has been in involved in that work of salvation. So I say the Jesus prayer for five minutes, uh, not, uh, you know, as needed, fast or slow, whatever it is, but we say it and we say it uh, with attention and we actually put, you know, there's a lot of talk about the noose and about you know, the heart, and really all the news is, is where the attention is. So if I put my attention into my physical heart, which is where my spiritual heart is, because there, there, there are uh, two realities that co in here, you know, this world is not only spiritual or material, it's both. And in this world, that the shows us like through the Eucharist and through the things in the church that the spiritual and the material actually co in here in each other. They're not somewhere, spiritual is not somewhere out there and material here. The reality is, is that the Orthodox Church reveals that there's a deep spirituality in matter. Otherwise, Christ wouldn't have taken flesh. He wouldn't have become matter. And because of the incarnation, matter now matters. Um, matter becomes the way by which we are, um, uh, by which grace is conveyed to us. This is what the sacraments of the church are. The sacraments of the church are matter that conveys to us the grace of God, the water of baptism, the oil of chrismation, um, the uh, bread of the Eucharist, um, the stole of the priest who absolves us of, of confess in confession, um, the unction oil, all of these things are ways in which the church conveys to us grace. The icons in the church, you know, when they stream myrrh and stuff like that, what is that a sign of? Is that matter conveys grace? Matter conveys the life of God to us. And say, uh, Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, he said something like, matter is, is the medium by which we can't, we can't receive this grace any other way except through the stuff of this world. Um, St. Maximus says that on our journey to God, he says that the world now lies before us as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, we have to pass through this world, he says, in order to find the, the true and, and salvific knowledge of God. He says, you can't circumvent around the world. We have to go through this world in order to get to God. And so we experience that in communion at, at the Eucharist. The grace of God is conveyed to us through the matter of this world, the bread and the wine become truly and ineffably, and somehow in a way that's inexplicable, the very body and blood of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. And we experience the grace in that oftentimes. So matter now conveys to us grace. And as we understand prayer, we're only going to the heart so that, again, so that we can receive grace because it's through the matter of this world that grace will be conveyed to us. So we put our attention or our noose, our attention into our physical heart. And we say the Jesus prayer, trying to keep our attention in our own heart, speaking to the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. So this is the basis of the five and five rule. Trisagion, um, if you want, Psalm 50, the creed, five prostrations using the body, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. If you are too, if your back is bad like mine, then sometimes all you can do is make the sign of the cross and make a slight bow. But in, in any case, we're using the body and then we say the Jesus prayer. Now, don't sit down doing that. You stand or you kneel, but don't sit. Because if we sit down, we become kind of unconscious and start to kind of fade away. We want to try to keep our attention. So either kneeling or standing, we say the Jesus prayer for five minutes. After that, um, we could say some of the prayers from the prayer book if we like or not. It's up to us, you know, how we'd like to do it. But they're all there. You know, they're, they're all uh, very available and very beautiful prayers. But it's, it's important to, to, to pray before we use those, because sometimes if we just start saying prayers from the prayer book, again, we haven't come back to our own heart. We're not really centered, and we can't really speak to God in the, in the deepest possible way. Saying that Jesus prayer prepares us to be able to say those things to God in a way that's meaningful. So a lot of times I just use a few of those prayers that I know by heart. I use them after I've said the Jesus prayer for quite a while, and then read a chapter from the gospel. A chapter from the gospel. Using the gospel, the scriptures are a, a, an incredible 
wealth of information, but we a uh, wealth of um, grace and life in the church, but we need to prepare ourselves before we uh, encounter them because otherwise we won't be able to receive them. Um, it's very hard for us to, to, to not be um, uh, too quick and, and um, um, I don't know, we kind of read with our head and not with our heart. And so as we pray, we can actually squeeze those words in the gospel and receive a word from God himself. It's, it's through those words that God will speak to us and we'll find that if we're faithful in that process, we'll, we'll see a word that pops out at us one day and we think, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I need today. It's exactly what my situation is. This is exactly where I'm at. Somehow God uses that in a way that's unbelievable sometimes. Um, after you've said, uh, after you've read a uh, chapter from the gospel, or even just, you know, as much as you can in the sense of like, uh, you know, several verses, read it just, I know this is kind of involved and I know it's, it's all in my book, you know, if you need it, uh, or at the very least, just understanding the kind of principles of this, um, being consistent, being flexible and starting again, seeing prayer as a conversation. Um, these are the, the kind of basic kind of premises that we have to start with, with the art of prayer. But after you read the gospel, just read a little bit like a paragraph from some spiritual book like St. Sophroni or like uh, Elder Porphyrius, St. Porphyrius or St. Paisios or somebody like that that's a, a more of a modern elder that uh, is canonized by the church like St. Sophroni. If you just read a paragraph from him, at that point of after praying, the words become alive. They become much more available to us and we can oftentimes squeeze them and find an amazing grace that comes through those words. After you've read just a little bit of spiritual reading, say it is truly me to bless you, Othea Tokos, ever blessed and most pure, the mother of our God, more honorable than cherubim, more glorious beyond compared than the seraphim without corruption that made us, uh, gave us birth to God, the word truth, Othea Tokos, magnify thee, make a prostration, say glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and ever to ages of ages, amen, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, to the prayers of our Holy Fathers, the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. That's it. it takes about 10 minutes. It's just that basic rule right there. But if you're consistent at it, you know, I've, I give this uh, lecture for many years and uh, uh, this talk uh, to many places. And I remember I went to one place in uh, on the East Coast and there was a woman there and she said, you know, I was, I, there, I was there with the icon of St. Anna. And uh, there was a woman there. She said, you know, you came to our parish a couple years ago and uh, uh, you gave that prayer rule that, that uh, you spoke about. And she says, and I've been, you, I've been doing it ever since you left last, uh, you know, two years ago, she says, and you know what? She said, it, it worked. And I was like, yes. And I was like, this is, this is exactly what, you know, it's like testimonials. It's like, you know, her life was changed just through this very simple, uh, easy prayer rule, but uh, well, simple, but it's not always easy to do. But uh, it really does change our lives and gives us the grace of God, which we can't acquire any other way. This art of prayer is something that we can continue to explore. And if we're consistent, God will instruct us. God himself will instruct us and help us to understand. And we can increase 10 prostrations, 10 minutes saying the Jesus prayer. We can even get up to, you know, 15 or 20. But the reality is if we're consistent, this miracle will be open to us as well. And we just need to be open, open to the, to the miracle of prayer. Um, I was just reading St. Sophroni this morning, and he said something like, prayer, he says, that is to say God, which is, you know, kind of a bold statement. He says, uh, for, no, he said, for prayer, he said, that is for God. He says, no sickness of spirit is um, unhealable, or, or, or um, what did he say? He said, uh, um, like, basically, with prayer, which he says is in its highest form, St. Gregory Sinai says, is God. He says, every sickness in, in, of the spirit can be healed. So there's always hope with prayer. There's always a great hope with prayer, the miracle of prayer that can happen in our own lives. And he, and he says that, he says, we may be deeply sinful, he says, but when we resolve to keep the commandments and we begin to turn to the Lord, he says that um, uh, a basic healing begins in our hearts and in our lives. And so we always have this hope that no matter where we're at and no matter how good or bad we think we're doing, um, Really, prayer moves us towards God in a way that is unto salvation, gives us knowledge that we can't have any other way, and prepares us to receive the greater communion of life in the church. So I thank you for uh, listening tonight, and it's nice to be with you. Um, and I was, uh, you know, if, if anybody has any questions, I could uh, field a, a couple of them before I have to go off to bed.
Can you repeat the name of your book? Your book? Um, the name of my book is Acquiring the Mind of Christ. Uh, it's available on Amazon or St. Tikhon's Monastery Press. Oh, and also, uh, just as, a, again, a note, um, you know, we, we do uh, live stream our liturgies on Saturday, uh, Saturday night vigil and Sunday morning liturgy and pre-sanctified uh, or one Lenten service a week. So you can always uh, find that on St. Tikhon's Monastery.org or uh, St. Tikhon's Monastery Facebook or YouTube. Um, and there's also a way to submit prayer requests uh, through that portal. So if you have a request in prayer, uh, we'd be glad to, to pray for you and to, to hear from you. Um, the monastery is doing everything it can during these difficult times. We know it's difficult for everyone. So um, we're offering that service, for, especially if you can't make it to church on a day when your church might be closed or if uh, things get worse or better or whatever it might be, uh, that service is being offered. And it's a way for us to know about your prayer requests and be able to pray for you and help you if we can. Because uh, we're always here praying, uh, hoping and praying and working hard to do other things as well. Our publications, all the things that we do, we have seminarians and, um, you know, do things, uh, a lot of different uh, activities. But just know that uh, we're always here for you if, you, if needed. And uh, um, we're, we're, we're available uh, for, for, to help and assist uh, you in your time of need. Other questions? Father, uh, yes, Father. Uh Th thank you so much. And I, my question has to do with uh, two other parts of prayer and where you would how you would suggest we incorporate them. One is uh, prayer for others. Uh, in this time of the internet, we all know so many people who are suffering and have needs or have asked us to pray for them. Where would you like that to fit? Where would you advise that to fit in our daily prayer? And the other one would be a confession, a daily confession of our sins. Do you think mm -hmm. that's useful? And if so, where would you advise us to put that? Again, thank you so much. Uh, you, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Um, that's a great question. So typically when you pray for other people, I would say towards the end of saying the Jesus prayer, just start mentioning people by name, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon, um, you know, uh, my daughter, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon Mrs. So and so, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon you know the catechumen James. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon thy world. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon all those who are sick with COVID. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon all those in the nursing and, and health professions. Um, and then usually after we're kind of towards the end of the Jesus prayer, once we're done with the Jesus prayer, that's usually when we can um, you know ask saints to pray for us. You know, Holy Hierarchy, God, pray to God for us. You know, uh, Saint Sophroni, pray to God for us. Most Holy Mother of God, save us. We can easily, you can even, um, you know, Most Holy Theotoko, save us can be used uh, as well um, in our, in that um, place of, you know, in also in addition to the Jesus prayer. Um, but a lot of times at that point, I ask God to forgive me all my sins and I thank him for the day. I ask him to bless the day, um, to forgive me for anything specific that, that I know that I've done that I need to correct. And I, I constantly beseech the Lord to help me to correct my life, which of course is always in need of correcting. Um, and I do make that confession, you know, of, of forgiveness, asking for the Lord's forgiveness. And, uh, you know, St. Silouan says, the moment we ask the Lord to forgive, he forgives. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to know. And then we go to confession just to confirm that and to receive that kind of completion of that forgiveness, which is sacramental and real. A lot of times it unbinds us from some of those things that we've been carrying or that, that are, are afflicting us even, uh, and then also afflict us on a deeper psychological, spiritual, and emotional level. So does that answer your question? Father, I'm at a time in my life where if I do prostrations, I can't get back out. And that's not going to, that's not going to improve. Uh, sure. So I would you know, just do just if you're standing in your icon corner, just make the sign of the cross, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us, and just a slight bow. You know, they, they you know, just you don't have to go very far down. Just again, moving the body in prayer, connecting our body to prayer is really, really important. Why? Um, because a lot of times it helps us to to come back to ourselves and then speak to God from the very depth of our being, which is where we need to speak to God from. Otherwise, we might just be kind of like talking to God. But the reality is, is that we're kind of outside of ourselves. Uh, Saint uh, Father Zechariah says we're outside of the Father's house when we're outside of our own heart. So we're not really speaking to God in a way that, you know, people ask and say, well, why doesn't God hear my prayer? And I would say one of the things that might be possible, you know, there's, there's a basic answer that says, well, God always answers prayers. It's just either 
yes, uh, not yet, or I have something better for you. Um, those are the three answers that God gives. But sometimes I think we're also just, we're not really collected. You know, we haven't really prepared ourselves to speak to God from our, our you know, it's really important to use the phone booth or the phone of the heart. Like it's, it's almost like trying to talk to somebody on the phone and you're across the room and you're kind of shouting at the phone and they're saying, what, what are you saying? Is I can't hear you. It's like, come closer to the phone. Well, the phone is the heart, you know? So I really have to use the phone and it's like, I have to be close to the phone. And if I'm not close enough to the phone, God is like, God can kind of hear me, but it's really like, it's important to understand that there really is a dynamic to it where, if I'm speaking to God outside of myself or farther, if I'm distracted and I'm just kind of mm, chattering, as it were, uh, it's not it's not very effective. When I speak to God from that deep place of the heart, God hears those prayers because I'm really inside myself. It's the place where the phone is. I'm closest to the phone as possible. And from that place, God really can hear me. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I think Doug has a question. He's. Well, I don't have. I don't have a question. I have a testimony. Oh. Okay. Is that an Orthodox word? Sure. Why not? We can I, use it now. I come out of the uh, Protestant world, uh -huh. and I like uh, read my Bible every day for like decades, right? Just mm -hmm. about every day. But I never really had any any kind of prayer life. And uh, my uh, godfather gave me a prayer book, and I just started doing like two pages out of the uh, morning prayer book almost every day. And it's really valuable. And I kind of stop about halfway through. There's a place where you talk about, well, I can't remember it now, but something about come and heal us or something like that. And at that point, I have a little prayer list where I go over the, you know, the things that i that I want to consistently pray about. And so my testimony is that it's actually really valuable. And as a Christian, and I've had some significant answers to prayer, and I think, you know, it's just by picking the darn little book up and going through it, it, it uh, is a decent way to start. Yep, thanks for your words. <clears throat> no matter what... Uh, what we can say is that prayer is uh, one of the most valuable commodities in the world. It's very, not really well understood and we should never approach it as if we get it. You know, I never think of like, oh, I understand prayer. Well, I know what prayer is. I, I get prayer, I, I pray. The reality is I, I always just start again. I just start again and I, I experience prayer as, as a very deep and meaningful uh, inter interaction and interchange with God and with myself. And ultimately through it, I come to a greater appreciation and knowledge of the Lord and of the church and of myself. And there's really nothing more valuable in my life. And as we, if we put the effort into it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll experience the same. Well, thank you, Father Sergis. I don't want to keep you up any longer. I know it's time for bed. Um, but if your talks are this good, when you're this tired, you must be pretty good during the day. Anyway, <laughs> we sure appreciate it. And let's end with a prayer, okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. It is truly meet to bless you, O Theotokos, ever blessed and blessed and most pure, Father of our God, and all the words beyond the fear of the seraphim. Found that you gave birth to God the Word. True Theotokos, we magnify you. Okay, thank you. Good night. You God bless. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you again. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.